Welcome back to what I hope is the final installment of the Philco 90 restoration series. There's a few tasks left. We're going to start off with wrapping up the chassis. It's been fully recapped, new resistors, good set of tubes, it's been aligned. What we need to do though is address the very first thing we did with the set, which was we tacked in a new vinyl lamp cord, AC line cord, and a couple filter electrolytic caps that are just kind of floating here with some electrical tape on them. We want to clean all that up. For the line cord, I've got some nice reproduction cloth covered stuff that we can use. I also have a couple types of reproduction old time looking receptacle plugs. I'll uh, choose one that looks period correct, or maybe I've got an old one I can reuse. The one that came with this was kind of smashed, so I don't want to use that. And then there are the filter caps. We have a few choices. One, uh, we could tidy this up a little bit and leave them down below. Two, we can cut open the original caps and hide new caps inside and run the wiring to the original points on them. I'm a little torn. Um, I don't want to leave it like it is because we have two holes on it. I know you think, well, who's going to look underneath the chassis who looks at the back of the radio? Underneath the chassis, you're right. It's Nobody's really going to look under here unless they're servicing it. Um, but the back of the radio is somewhat visible because the, there are no actual backs to these radios. They're open to the air. And it's nice to keep it looking original, for one, if you ever want to sell it. I mean, you know, on eBay, you typically see the back of the inside of the radio. And when there's holes or there's something that looks wrong or there's modern parts sticking out, tends to lower the value if that's your concern. Also, it's just nice in the interest of preserving history to, to keep it, because we've got them. I mean, why not, why not put them back in? So the downside to restuffing them, in my opinion, is we need to destroy them, in effect. We need to cut them open. We need to slice them open either down here somewhere or well, up around the lip. So there's, there's a few different types that Philco used. So for this type where it's got a big old nut that mounts through the hole, if we cut it anywhere along here, it's going to be very visible. You could wrap some aluminum tape around it or something. It would look pretty bad in my opinion. So really your only option is to cut it right around the, the seam up here. And I've done it before. I mean, it's not that hard to do. This is aluminum. You can actually get a sharp utility knife and go back and forth a few times around and you can pop that cap off. Get out the spongy uh, innards of this, put the new cap in there, run the wires down below, kind of glue up or do something to secure that cap back on, and we can. Um, and then do something similar to this. Now this type is also a big nut around the bottom, but it doesn't have that seam up top. Uh, so this is going to be a little trickier. Uh, you could try to cut it right along that seam, it wouldn't be too visible. But anyways, that's one option, is to cut these open as best you can, put new caps inside and seal them up to make it as invisible as possible. Plan B, which I'm leaning towards, is to uh, clean off the crud uh, and reinstall them and leave them disconnected completely and mount the new caps securely, discreetly, down below. I'm leaning towards that because, well, we've, yes, we've restuffed a bunch of these, but there was non-destructive. The Bakelite blocks, we just had to pop out the old insides, put new stuff in, we had, didn't have to cut them. So if we're trying to preserve things, let's just leave these exactly the way they are and just tack in some new parts below. It's obviously we've tacked in a bunch of new resistors, so the original look is gone if that, that's what, what our goal was. So I think having a couple new caps visible is in the end of the world. Plus it lets somebody know who may service down the road that, hey, it's got some new caps, the old ones are disconnected. If you hide caps and do a really, really good job so it's not obvious, 
Well, somebody working on it might not realize that there are new caps in there. You can put a note or something that, that would kind of help out with that. Uh, but that's a dilemma. You see this in the hobbies all the time. People in this hobby, I should say, discussed in the forums or videos of how do you go about doing it. Now, if I go back to the start of this video, the premise was to kind of keep things simple for beginners. So that's another reason why I'm inclined to do it. Just leave the old ones alone, leave them in there, cut all the connections off of them, and just install the new caps. And we're going to explore where, where should we secure them, where can we secure them. This isn't the greatest solution, because only one end of the cap is secured, the other is just going to a wire with electrical tape around it. Potentially, this could move around and short into something. Also, not the greatest idea to have caps next to something that generates heat. Now, these don't really get that hot. You know, it looks like a 100-watt resistor down there, but that's just kind of the way they made them. That actually generates very little heat. But, uh, again, it's not very secure. Also, in the process of doing this, some of these old crunchy wires, the insulation failed a bit on them. So, in particular, this wire going up to the power switch... Uh, the insulation failed right down here, and I want to run off. I've got some red cloth-covered reproduction wire. I want to run a new wire down there. In other words, we want to make this safe and secure, and good time to add a fuse. I do not want to drill a hole in the back of the chassis to install a fuse holder, so we're going to install discreetly an inline pigtail fuse somewhere in here if we can find a good place to do it. And for the line cord, we'll do like they did back then, which is to uh, tie a knot in it. I think they might have tied a knot in both sides on this originally, but for sure you want one on the inside, so you can't pull the cord out. Here's what I went with in the end. I found a vintage big light knob. It may have even come from this chassis or my other 90 chassis. I'm not entirely sure. I have a little junk box full of these. This one looked to be in good enough condition uh, that it could be reused. So I took my cloth covered reproduction wire, pulled back some of the cloth insulation, took two of the, the two uh, plastic insulated wires, pulled them apart a bit, tied an underwriter's knot. That is an underwriter's knot, in case you're not familiar, I will post a link to it so you can uh, learn how to tie one, it's not that difficult. What does that do for you? Strain relief. You can't pull this out. And then I strip the ends, put them under the screw terminals, put a little bit of solder on the fraying uh, stranded copper ends. And finally, I had to reproduce an insulating disc because uh, the original is gone, but something like that. Now when you pull back the insulated shroud, here let me show you on a, an extra scrap I have left. So underneath this, come on focus, it's just conventional plastic insulated two conductor wire. This I believe is nylon. So you pull it back and you can see it starts fraying. Well, one thing you can do to stop the fraying is use a lighter to melt the ends. Which, yeah, it helps, but it's not, you can still slide it around. So on top of that, I put heat shrink tubing. And that uh, seals the deal pretty well. But what I don't get about these vintage plugs is uh, whenever I've come across them, it's just been the two conductor wire going right through this hard bake light shell and out of the screw terminals, and that's it. And the two wires are just flopping around in there. Uh, it seems to me that eventually they're going to fray and break because there's no boot, there's no insul uh, there's no <laughs> like rubber boot on there to provide some cushioning. Um, so typically, uh, I'll put a couple layers of heat shrink tubing of you know increasing diameter just to give it something, but even so, it's not that great. I've looked online, there are places that make these reproduction um, plugs that look just like this, but they don't sell any kind of boot for it. 
So maybe that's just the way they made them, but I was expecting there to be, you know, something like this on the soldering iron, how there's a, like a strain relief, kind of rubber thingy. But anyways, that's, that's all I'll leave it for now until uh, I know any better. Uh, that underwriter's knot does a really good job. There's, there's no way you're going to pull that out. So, that's that. Alright, moving on to electrolytics. I started undoing the electrical tape and kind of tracing out the wiring. So this guy... You know, two electrolytic caps here. And they're, they're only 6 microfarad originally. Why are they so small? We got one filter choke here, we have another filter choke and a field coil. They do the brunt of the filtering of the pulsed DC coming out of the rectifier tube. So we get away with pretty small caps. These are 10 microfarad. Almost double what they were originally. But 6 is not a standard value. You could, you could hunt around and find 6.8 if you really wanted to get closer to it, but 10 is, will work just fine. You don't want to go crazy and put like a 47 or a 100 in there or something because there is a limit on, say, an 85, 80 rectifier tube. And this set's been off for a long time and that cap is completely discharged and you turn this on. That's going to look like a dead short for a brief moment. If you had a huge capacitor in there, that could damage the 80 rectifier tube. You could see some arc over in there. It could strip some of the cathode material off. So don't, don't go crazy. 10 is just fine. All right, so where can we put them? Well, trace this out. We've got one wire going up this way to the filter chokes. There's a wire going down here. And there's a wire going over to the socket, going to the speaker. And there's a wire going somewhere down there, I think, to one of the tubes. Yeah, that must be going to the 47 output tube. So we're looking at this cap. It's grounded on one end. So one side filter choke. Uh, and a wire going to the plug for the speaker and another wire going to the 47 tube and also it goes to a few other things as well. Well, they used to all join up at the lug sticking out of that filter cap. It's no longer there. Well, what I was thinking we could do is have things join up over here instead on the plug going to the speaker. So we take this out and we just need to extend a couple wires over here. And then there is a good grounding point right over here. There's a rivet going to the chassis into this tube socket. So there's a good solid ground there. And a positive here, we can put the cap right across that. It's just not too far from where it was originally. Um, it's kind of close to a central, kind of a star distribution point of all the B plus will be coming out from this point radiating outwards. So I think it's a really good place to put it. And of course it cleans up all this mess that we currently have down here. And then we'll see about doing the other one, which I think will be even easier because there's less stuff going to it. Now as far as the caps we're going to use, I use these initially because they're axial, meaning they have the leads coming out of the axes of the cap, so it gives me a lot of lead length to play around with to locate them. However, you really can't get high grade axial caps anymore. Well, what do I mean by that? I mean these are rated for 85 degrees Celsius. Which is fine. The general purpose caps, they'll work. They'll work fine for a long time, but you can get something better. You can get caps with higher temperature rating. What does that mean? Heat is what kills capacitors, generally speaking, electrolytic caps. There's a formula for how to estimate the life expectancy and it's dominated by temperature. The cooler you run them, the longer they last. Now they also have something called self-heating, meaning if they are, there's a lot of current sort of going through them. I know current doesn't really go through a cap. But in other words, if they're in a very demanding filter application, 
they can internally heat. They don't have zero resistance. There's a the ESR, equivalent series resistance. There's some resistance in a cap. So if they're absorbing a lot of AC ripple and they have some internal resistance, they will start getting warm. Again, this isn't a very demanding application. I'm just talking theoretically. Well, you can get caps that are rated for both higher ripple current and higher temperature, both of which translate to extended life. Some of them are even called like extended life, high temperature, high ripple caps. They'll cost a lot more than these. Maybe instead of a dollar, they'll be five dollars. But the lifetime, the life expectancy, these are typically like 2,000 hours. These will be 20,000 hours. Now you might be thinking 2,000 hours, that's not very long at all. That's 2,000 hours at 85 degrees Celsius with 450 volts across it. In other words, the absolute maximum is, uh, um, uh, voltage and current that it's designed for, you'll get 2,000 hours. You go lower than that on either one of them and the life increases dramatically. I'm just saying, if it's your treasured radio and you want to put a few extra bucks into it to make it last longer, buy some high grade, name brand, high temperature, high ripple current, extended life caps. It'll last longer than you will probably. <laughs> Um, but those will not come in axial leads. They will come in radial, meaning both the leads come out of one end. However, for at least this one, if we're going to tuck it into this little corner here, and the lugs are not that far apart, we can get away with it. So let me go see what I can dig up. I will also show you an even more extreme example if you really want to get some long life out of it. Alrighty, I went down to my parts inventory, and I think I'll go with these. These are Nichicon, Time Microfarad, 450 volt, rated for 105 degrees Celsius, they're VZ series. Notice they're smaller, and again, both the leads come out of one end. Alright, I mentioned a more extreme solution, and that would be these guys. 6.8 microfarad polypropylene caps. These are plastic film caps, there's no electrolytic in them to dry out or break down. These will last, well, not literally forever, but a lot longer than electrolytics. Downside, they're even more expensive. They're bigger, they don't mount easily, they're meant for circuit board mounting, so you'd have to rig something up. If you wanted to restuff the cans, uh, they won't really fit inside, so yeah. I'm just saying, if you really wanted to kind of Put something in there and forget about it and last forever effectively um, this is an option just like those white ones I showed earlier that uh, I was speculating we could use and I have used before uh, anyways so let's go ahead and get this guy mounted clean up the wiring down here and then find a place for the final cap and then believe it or not we are done with the chassis at least all the electrical work I finished up work down below. I will briefly go over what I did. So, new line cord, three production cloth covering. Put it through the hole, tied a knot for strain relief, pushed back the cloth covering, singed it with a lighter to stabilize the fraying end, heat shrink tubing over that. One wire goes directly to the bake light block. The other went through uh, some heat shrink tubing to hide a uh, Two amp slow blow pigtail fuse go into the other cap inside of that big light block. Capacitors, one of them is going to that speaker socket, and the negative side goes to a lug that goes to the chassis. I extended one of the wires that used to just go right over to this filter cap. That's this new yellow cloth covered wire going up this way. And the final cap is over here. The negative on this cap does not go to the chassis. It goes to the final lug on this biasing resistor. And the positive is snaking around down here and it goes to the AD rectifier tube which is kind of hidden by this. So what I did is I took out the mounting screw. This very easily pulls back and allows you access to that tube socket. There is one other circuit modification you might want to consider. When this radio is cold, 
all tubes are cold, the caps are fully discharged. You go to turn it on, this cap looks like a dead short to this rectifier tube. Also, this tube heats up and starts working before the other tubes do, meaning there's not much of a load. So you've got a combination of essentially a dead short and no load. So that does two things. One, it stresses out this tube. That's why there's a maximum directly connected filter cap spec for this tube, which I think is 10 or 20 microfarad or something like that. If you put a 100 microfarad cap on this, you probably are going to see a spark or flash over when you turn this on because it's stripping electrons away from the filament to the plate. It's, it's overloading it for a brief instant until the cap charges up. Um, and the other issue is when the cap charges up because there's no load, it's going to be like peak maximum voltage here for a few seconds until the other tubes start conducting it'll pull that voltage down. Now these big old caps so this one I believe that means it's 6 microfarad rated for 475 what they don't show you often is there is a max surge voltage that these can handle that's typically well over 500 volts 525, 550 meaning it can handle an ex excess voltage for a few seconds these are so big and have so much surface area they can dissipate the, the heat and handle the, the extra abuse more than a modern cap can. Modern caps they often don't even spec out what that surge voltage can be which is a good indication it probably isn't much. Okay so what can we do? Uh, well there is a little bit of a load. I traced this out and with all the tubes being cold there's a 25k resistor and then a 70k resistor so basically it's about 100k to ground you could add another resistor going to ground, add more of a, a load, but that load's always going to be there, so it's going to pull down the B plus at all times, so that's not so great an idea. Well, what we can do is what you often see in later designs where they have a selenium rectifier, solid state rectifier. Those really can't handle surge current very well at all. So they put it in an ICL, an inrush current limiter, or a resistor. And that's what I pulled out here. Now these are not any old ordinary resistor. Well first off, what does a resistor do? What does a resistor do if you add one in here? It limits the amount of current that can flow into that cap. So instead of that cap looking like a dead short, it may, you could put a 4.7 ohm resistor in there. It's not much. You don't want to put a huge resistor in there because then when this set's operating, it's going to be, you're going to lose voltage across it. You put something there. We're only talking about a brief moment when you first turn the radio on, just to kind of help everything out. Now these are fusible resistors, the modern type. Um, that you may have seen old ones, and they're big. They're huge things. They plug. They plug in. They uh, they're very common in series strung TVs. Well, those are the modern version. That's 2.2 .2 ohm, 4.7 ohm. Um, if there was a dead short in a radio, these would blow out fairly quickly. They're designed to blow out safely. They're flame-proof, in other words. So these do double duty. They, they limit the inrush current, and it's a fuse. You're fusing your B+. So if a cap was to short out, say, you wouldn't kill the 80 rectifier. You wouldn't kill your power transformer. So not a bad idea to considering adding one of these. I should have, I could. Um, I didn't find a really convenient spot to do it, but that's no reason not to do it. Um, and I often don't because I forget to or I overlook it um, in the rush of you know, getting the radio working, but it, it really is, for a few pennies, it does definitely give you some peace of mind and help protect hard to replace components. Now back to the speaker with the open field coil. I'm still trying to get this field pole piece out. I thank you for all the suggestions. Definitely a multi-ton press is the way to go. And I would love to use one. Uh, Harbor Freight carries a six ton uh, press that was, goes for about 80 bucks plus tax. That would be perfect. 
they are out within 100 miles of my location and they have no idea when they might get any more in. Um, I looked on Craigslist and yeah, maybe for 100 bucks, somebody in my area has a 12 ton press for sale. Uh, but I gotta <laughs> give myself a reality check. How much money do I really want to spend on this speaker? Um, the next press up at Harbor Freight is like 180 bucks. If I buy one online, they start at about 140. Uh, and then I still need to buy an output transformer. There was a cost of the, of, you know, and time and labor to, to do all this and to rewind the field coil. <laughs> it's just a speaker. I don't want to spend $300 um, on this speaker. Interesting though it may be. Um, now those of you who suggested using a vice or uh, like a, a gear puller, um, I really don't think that would work. This was put together with a multi-ton press. It was never meant to come apart. Uh, so you really should use something like that to take it apart. I almost bought a bottle jack for 20 bucks and thought I could put together my own rig. I do have leftover lumber from rebuilding the front porch. Uh, but I don't have the heavy-duty bolts I would need to put it together, so that would cost me a bunch more money, too. So, what are we going to do? Well, one thing I did buy at Harbor Freight was a big old hammer. So, we're going to take another whack at this. Pun intended. Another suggestion I got was to try heating it up. And when I put it back together, to put the pole in the freezer and heat up this. That's a great idea. My only concern about getting it apart is when I heat this, the heat's going to transfer to the, to the pole. I mean, I will try to just heat around the edge, um, and hopefully that will help. Uh, I also saw one of you was concerned about mushrooming the top of this over, and I may have already. See, I'm not entirely sure where does this begin and this end, <laughs> or, you know, what, where is, what part is going through. I think it's this inner part. Um... You'll see there's a groove there and there's kind of an outer ring and like an inner ring. I think it's the outer ring. And if it is, yeah, it's mushroomed over. It could also be the entire circumference of this. I can't quite tell. But I can see the wisdom in using a ball peen hammer because it directs the force, assuming you hit it <laughs> fairly accurately, in the middle. Uh, and I'm going to use this washer as an assist to keep the, try to keep that force in the middle. And I would love to put this up on some heavy steel blocks like you would get with a press. Just couldn't dig anything up, um, so I'm using some um, pavers. That's better than wood, I figure, at any rate. So let's get this heated up and give it some taps. Uh, also, yeah, some of you mentioned, or were, were concerned this could crack. This, I'm pretty sure, is cast iron. Um, so we've got to be a little bit careful about that, too. Eh, I don't think it's moved at all. <laughs> I'm going to switch back to using a socket. Mushrooming out the, uh, the ratchet socket pretty good. I think it has come down a bit. There do, it does seem to be standing a bit proud of the outer frame. Alright, well, I'll keep trying a little bit longer. Heat it up a bit more, too. I still want to get a press though, because I'm going to have to put this thing back together. I don't want to have to... Although, yeah, I mean, I will try freezing the pole piece, which may help. Should help.
I never thought in the process of restoring an antique radio I would be doing something like this. Yeah, it is moving. It is coming down. <laughs> very, very slowly. that one over. I'm going to switch to another one. Yeah, I can definitely tell it's coming down now. We still got a long way to go. Oh man, I don't think I was recording when I got it out, but <laughs> I got it out. Uh, and it's about as, it's pretty darn hot, so um, I'm not sure that uh, heating, I think when I put it back together, heating and cooling will definitely help tremendously um, but I think this got about as hot just got just about as hot as the uh, outer piece did uh, broke paver in the process and here here is the offender I uh, think get a little bit of toasted around one top edge I don't think I would I mean I don't have to reuse this but I think I probably should Let's see how thin this plastic is and see how much how thick that is that's all wire there is a lot of wire weight yeah this is at least a pound at least a pound of wire on here oh this is cooled yet yeah i guess i can hold it so yeah so what i uh, did i'm not sure what got recorded and what didn't um I went through several of these um, sockets. I used metric sockets because I had no use for them really. Um, using a larger one helped too. That gave me, of course, more surface area to hit on. I started with these smaller ones because I wasn't entirely sure what portion of this was the pole. You know, I thought it might have been the inner because there's a there's a groove in there. That is a little too hot to hold. Um, Anyways, yeah, using this one, which is just pretty close to being the same size as that. And uh, definitely going with a beefier hammer. So, uh, Harbor Freight did come through in one regard. I think I paid 10 bucks for this, something like that. Handle's already a little loose after <laughs> using it for maybe 20 wax. Get what you pay for. Alright, well I'm going to let everything cool down and then we'll uh, take a closer look. Okay, let's see what we've got. Sorry for the background noise, I'm right next to the furnace. So there was the issue. So this was mushroomed over at the top, either when they made it or from my attempts to uh, my earlier attempts to whack it when I may have been hitting the edge you can see how it's shinier there once I got past that the rest uh, just a couple taps came came right out uh, and I'm lucky because I was not thinking I should have put something soft underneath this because when I tapped out it hit the concrete floor um, if I damaged this that would be really tragic because <laughs> that is where the spider screws into internally threaded hole there we need to to keep that intact this is this is all crucial well the whole thing is this has to be dead center in this hole and the spider sorry not the spider I mean the voice coil rides in that groove between the two pieces of metal so I, uh, I've been posting on the Philco forum about this and I got some advice about um, 
well, the whole process of getting it apart and back together. And uh, I was concerned about having getting the center when I put it back together. And I was assured that because of the wide shoulder here, once this is firmly seated, it'll be pretty well self-centering. I do wonder, though, this. It seems like when I force this through with the mushroom top, it kind of may have worn this down a little bit, too. Still, I mean, that, there's a lot of metal in there. I, I think it'll be fine. Uh, probably cut out a new piece of uh, masonite or whatever for that. In fact, yeah, that was one of the issues with this, too, is the field coil. Um, there should be two of these supports, and one of them had broken in half and fallen out, so the field coil was flopping around uh, inside. And who knows, maybe that's what lead, led to it getting uh, damaged, too. So hopefully, when we put this, uh, when we get this all back together, interesting, too, that I just noticed, so the rivets that, that held this together, boy, that really, uh, those rivets really cut some grooves into this metal. I'm thinking this may be uh, fairly soft, mild uh, steel or cast iron. A little bit rusty. Uh, I think I might be out of evapo rust, but I should probably pick some up. I can toss this both pieces in there and get rid of that white surface corrosion. There's a little bit on this too. All right, so we will put those aside, and uh, now we get to work on this. That would be kind of funny if I just pull, <laughs> if I found the brake uh, just a couple turns further in, <laughs> then I would have a tough decision to make. Um, or if, you know, I'll, I'll keep unwinding this. If I find the brake fairly close to this outside, I think I'd be inclined to uh, splice in and just wrap some new wire around and keep the bulk of this on here rather than taking it all off and having to wind new wire all back on. I have no clue where the brake might be. Where's the other end of the wire? It comes out between these two pieces. I've done this once before, and I, the, the break was near one of the outside edges, like like it had gotten physically abraded at some point. You know, like from this edge getting uh, messed with. I don't know, so the, the deal is, well, you know, assuming we have to rewind this whole thing, we'll be taking all this off. And to put it on, how are we going to do that? Well, the one good thing is there's no special winding pattern to this. It doesn't matter. It's, electro, it's an electromagnet. It's not a coupling transformer or, or you know, a tuned circuit or anything like that, so we don't need any special winding pattern. Well, we're going to get uh, a couple cylinders, one for the new spool of wire and one for this. And we will use an electric drill on uh, low and we will wind it. And we've got to make sure we have, don't have any friction. Well, um, <laughs> we have to keep enough tension that the wire doesn't kink and get messed up. But we can't put too much tension or we'll snap the wire, which is a tragic thing to have happen. So you can see is when, I, when I've got this just on my finger and I'm pulling, the wire has enough strength that it doesn't break. But if I, this got a little kinked, yeah, the wire breaks. So you got to be careful. Thank goodness the wire wasn't any thinner. Then uh, we'd, have, <laughs> we'd have a challenge. And then you would need something like a roller that has bearings or something that has less friction so these can roll more easily. But this as okay as it is. You can buy winding jigs. Uh, they can do what patterns or, you know, do it more neatly, but for this, we'll be okay. So, what I'm getting at is, as I'm winding it, if I just do it kind of freehand or with an electric drill, it's going to wobble around a little bit. The wire is going to end up crossing over itself. That should not be an issue. Speaking of, so there's a really noticeable dent in this right here. I wonder what that's all about. 
I wonder if when they wound this there was some there were some kinks on the wire or is that what the damage is? Well, we'll keep on winding this and find out. Oh, I should also mention I don't have to unroll this with ha having it roll like this. I can just put this on its end and it just goes much faster to do this. Ah, so I'm not entirely sure what I want to do. Um, this will take a, no matter how I do it, it's going to take a long time to get all this wire off. I could take a knife and slice through it on the side. But I am kind of curious to know where the break is and what might have caused it. So at least for now, I'll just keep, keep doing this. Uh, as far as saving this to maybe reuse in another project, yeah, this stuff costs 20 plus bucks a pound if you buy it, so I suppose I should try to save it. But on the other hand, it's old. Uh, I don't know how well the, the insulation stands up over 90 years or however old this is. Is it worth trying to save? Is it worth recycling? You have to burn off all the enamel to melt down the copper and it's so thin I think the copper would just kind of burn up. Before I put the chassis back in the cabinet I'm, I'm going over and cleaning it a bit more thoroughly. My first pass I just used a soft brush and some compressed air and got a lot of the surface dust and dirt off. But uh, as I was looking over it again, I was realizing it, it's still pretty darn dirty. For example, uh, this chassis had no tubes in it when I got it. It probably hadn't for a very long time. The yeah, tube sockets got really dirty. Here's one I haven't cleaned yet. Here's one I, I just finished. I think you can see there's quite a difference. How am I doing it? I'm using a Q-tip, getting it damp, just going around and then finishing it off with some Novus number one a plastic cleaner and protectants because I have a bunch of it on hand why not this phenolic material is plastic basically and I was playing around with the chassis the metal as I stated earlier it's a dangerous path to go down because how far do you want to go I just wanted to experiment because I got some suggestions. One of them was to try Gojo hand cleaner. But I'm having trouble finding the stuff that I'm used to where it comes in a white plastic tub. It's a white cream. You apply it. It turns clear. You wipe it off. The stuff I found in my local um, auto parts supplier looked more like hand sanitizer or something. So I I'd, I'd passed on that. Instead I had some goop at home. Which I tried, but unfortunately it has pumice in it, which worked, but there was a lot of grit that I had to clean off. I don't want that getting into the tube socket pin, so I'm not going to mess with that. Likewise, I've got some Noxon metal cleaner, metal polish, but that has baking soda, so that leaves some grit behind too. Uh, and I tried this, which is hydrochloric and phosphoric acid, which does a, a fine job. That's where this light patch is here. It removes rust and gets crud off, as it turns out this isn't just, um, well I mean it was, uh, what am I trying to say, it's not just a patina or discolored metal, there's kind of some baked on, caked on grime from over the years, and a, a, some scrubbing will get it cleaner, it seems especially bad around a transformer, I don't know if wax or tar has oozed out over the years, but uh, you know, the surface is rough. It's not smooth metal. There's, I could use my fingernail and kind of scrape um, gunk off of this thing. Well, I just couldn't resist. I went down the rabbit hole, so you don't have to. What do I mean by that? I mean, I removed some of the rust, treated some of the chassis, mainly to see what was possible and to give you some idea of what's involved and how it might look when you're done. So the main thing I did was there was a bad streak of rust so he must have dripped on top of the chassis here and, and came down. I removed it by putting the chassis on its backside so this was level 
and did about four rounds of this liquid rust stripper, which is a mixture of hydrochloric and phosphoric acid. Put it on, let it sit 10 minutes, wipe it off, reapply as needed. Also did these two spots. So you may notice that they're different colors than the rest of the chassis, as is this area. Yeah, that's because the steel chassis very likely cadmium plated. Where it's rusted is where the plating had failed for some reason and corrosion set in. So what we're looking at here is steel. This is probably cadmium plating. Also, this acid, when you put it on cadmium, corrosion tends to clean it off. Uh, but eventually, if you use too much of it, it takes it off completely. So in addition to where the rust was here, on either side of it, the plating got removed. So we kind of have a bit of a gradation. So here's where the corrosion was, here's where the plating got removed, here's where there's the original plating that's been cleaned. And how did I clean that? I did a light pass with the same stuff. It bubbles up, you get a little bit of fumes, you wipe it off, it looks like this. This area stayed gray for some reason, it's probably more heavily corroded, or maybe the plating is gone in this area. I mean, these weren't like super, super high quality plating that they did. Um, Alright, uh, and then after that I wiped it off, cleaned it off with some water, and then went over with a bit of metal polish to uh, kind of clean it up a bit. And this side is untreated, so here it's rough and, and gray looking, and here it's more silvery looking and smooth. Alright, so if you went over the whole chassis, removed all the corrosion, as I was getting at earlier, is this what you want? Yeah, there's no corrosion, but it's also all splotchy and weird looking. And, it, you know, for all the time and effort and chemicals that it took, is it worth it? Eh, I'll leave that up to you. If you want it to be completely uniform, you're going to have to remove all the plating or replate the whole thing. Otherwise, it's just not going to be an even color or paint it, which I'm not crazy about either just because of all the labor involved and so on. Now, you shouldn't leave it like this because now we've got raw steel in spots and it's going to start corroding again. So I go over it then with this which is a wax type product in liquid form. They make it for, well, I think it was Boeing originally invented it to help uh, prevent corrosion on their machinery. Uh, they also sell it for bike chains these days. Uh, real easy to apply. Just put it on, it's not toxic or anything. And you smear it around and let it dry and it leaves a film of wax which will help prevent any uh, future corrosion. It's not going to last forever, but it should last for a good long while. And I'll just leave it like this. And if you're wondering why do I use this and not navel jelly, it's because this doesn't have that pink goo gel stuff in it. It's, it's rather liquidy, so it's a little hard to use on ver vertical surfaces, although I have been having some luck here. Uh, but it's it's just it's acid essentially. Um, navel jelly, if it dries, there's all this crud that that uh, dries when that gelled stuff dries. This, if you let it dry, uh, nothing much would happen. You might get some flash rusting back, but you just apply more and wipe it off with a damp cloth, and you're done. I have been told though that they don't sell this anymore, or at least one of my viewers is having trouble finding it. So I I don't know. But that's, that's what it is. It's hydrochloric acid and phosphoric acid. I'm clean. I guess I should show you what it looks like when I put this directly on an untreated area of the chassis. I don't recommend you do this. I suggest you put it on a brush or something and smear it around. But, you know, just so you know, if you just let it dribble right on there and it starts to foam up. And spread it around, see it foaming. I'll let it sit for about a minute and wipe it off. Some I've had coming out looking like chrome after this treatment, but this one, uh, not so much. It smells a bit like sulfur, which makes me think that there's cadmium sulfide corrosion on this.
So, not a huge difference, but you know, I'm sure you can see it's, it's lighter there. It's also noticeably smoother when you run your finger over it. See, now I've gone down the rabbit hole that I was warning you about. Once I got the corrosion off of that, of course I want to get corrosion off of other areas. <laughs> I started my working my way up here and it turns out that what I thought was some uh, corrosion turned out to mostly be baked on tar, uh, crud, dirt, wax maybe. I think uh, basically it oozed out of this power transformer. And I was taking a closer look at it and notice how it's kind of bulged up. And the screw is really strained and kind of biting into the frame. Like this whole thing is kind of swelled up from the bottom. So maybe over the years, I've seen a lot of use in this thing getting really warm. It kind of put, um, mushed up. And I was also thinking, um, and still, still working on winding this uh, field coil. I did find an area that, I did find some breaks. Actually, I found two so far. And after the last break, I'm not even sure where the rest of the end is. But I did find a spot where it would look kind of burned and melted. And I'm wondering, did like an electrolytic short out or start to get really leaky and it strained the heck out of this power transformer, overheated it, it kind of swelled up inside until finally uh, this let loose. I'm just about done with this side of the chassis with the rust removing and applying the T9 bow shield and uh, I got to thinking that this transformer probably didn't swell up inside or anything like that. It got, it got whacked or it got dropped. This was shipped to me so it could have happened, um, the box might have been dropped while it was shipped to me, it could have been dropped at any point in its life, who knows. But you know, it's pretty clearly bent that way so it would make sense if it got dropped on this side that it would get bent over. Anyways, it works so I'm fine with that. Uh, I have been doing some light cleaning on the caps so I can reinstall them. I didn't want to go crazy because I didn't want to wipe out the old lettering. But I did notice this. 14 microfarad is the value stamped on it. Now this or schematic calls for 6. And I had suspected early on, based on this part number, that this was not the original cap. Now I'm convinced of it. It's got a big old dent in the side and it's not the right value anyway so I think when I reinstall it I'll do it something like that so you don't even see the other side. Now this one I do believe is the correct value, the part number matched. And that has that insulating wafer and all that. Even though this stuff is not connected I'll clean it, I'll clean it up and put it back there. And this one I think I will be more inclined to leave the lettering showing so it looks something like that when we're all done. Now if you're wondering, well, do we really need that bow shield, bowie shield? Yeah, so here's an area where I use that rust stripper and just a day later we've got flash corrosion coming right back. This was all clean metal not too long ago. That especially happens when you use an aggressive rust stripper that's just acid based. As soon as you wipe it off it's exposed to air and it corrodes right away again. It seems if you use something like navel jelly or for sure evapo rust that they don't corrode quickly or quite as quickly, but they will. I mean, if you whenever you strip rust and get down to bare raw metal, you've got to do something or it's going to start corroding again. I finished removing corrosion from around the transformer area. I was able to straighten out the the casing on it and I remounted it and I added some washers to kind of secure it better. Um, so now what? Well, I've gone about as far as I can unless I take it one step further as far as detailing the chassis goes and that is to take this big thing in the middle out. Which isn't as bad as you might think. So there are three screws down below. Those are the three we removed earlier when we replaced the, the rubber shock mounts on it. Other than that, there are a series of wire connections on the side. Uh, and if I get that out, I can clean up this whole area. I can polish up the sides of these cans and, you know, really finish off the job. But now I'm left with a choice.
And here's the other chassis. The one that was hacked up, the one that I'm not going to restore because it's just too much has gone, too much has been changed to it. But the tuning mechanism on this one is in better shape. Although as I say that I see that it's not actually working because it's a little stiffened up. Uh, but there's no corrosion on it. You know, compare the two. Um, there's corrosion on the, the plates here on the frame kind of all over. Uh, this is a little bit discolored and darkened. This doesn't have any of that. So at least what I want to do is remove it from this chassis and we'll take a look at what all, how it works and, and how it's connected up. And then I'll consider transplanting it. If I do that though, I will have to go through the alignment or at least some of the alignment steps again. Um, and there is something else I want to cover. Uh, I'll do it in the next segment. It occurs to me that we've looked at the schematic a lot, we've done the recapping and alignment and so on, but I don't think I've given you guys a good tour of the chassis to translate between what's on this and where is it on the radio chassis and how is it hooked up and what do some of these symbols mean. So for example, this I call it the, the tuning cap, this tuning assembly. There's four variable capacitors in here. Why do they need four of them? Where are they on the schematic? How do they work? What does it do? So kind of as a re, no pun intended, a recap of this project, I want to go back through and show you the uh, translating between the schematic and the functional blocks and the physical radio itself. And we'll also finish up the detailing. Uh, I think that's a good place to wrap up with this. Uh, oh, and I do have one final bit of good news. I did find the, uh, the brake and the field coil. So I now have continuity left. And I had, ended up removing about 20% of the winding. So I do have a couple choices. One, I could finish removing all of the wire and completely rewind the whole thing. As it is possible that it's been stressed out and there's perhaps some fragile insulation in some other areas. However, in the interest of being frugal, I would just assume, or what I am going to do, is splice um, the end of this and add some wire back onto it and see how that works out. The third option would be just to leave it as is and we lose maybe 20% of the magnetic field strength, but the speaker would still work. This wouldn't be quite as powerful as it was originally. But uh, yeah, that's, that's the plan. I'm going to splice in uh, some of that new wire that I got, wind on a few, I don't know, hundred, hundreds of turns to get the resistance back up to what it should be and then start putting it back together. We will do all that in the next installment as well. That is going to be it for this segment.